This podcast is sponsored by Xgrowth. Xgrowth is the APAC ABM agency. If you and your organization are looking to land and expand enterprise and mid-market deals, Xgrowth is the agency to help. Xgrowth works with a wide range of international and global technology vendors, service providers, and B2B SaaS companies. If this sounds like some of your interest to know more about, make sure to check out Xgrowth at xgrowth.com.au. That's X-G-R-O-W-T-H dot com dot E-U and chat with the APAC ABM agency. What's up, marketers, and welcome to another episode of the Growth Colony Podcast. I'm Liza from Xgrowth to tell you that each episode we bring in B2B leaders to chat about how you can achieve those everyday wins in the marketing world. Whether you're new to the B2B game, working at a leadership level, or even just showing some interest, we know you'll love the episode. So grab a drink, get comfy, and enjoy the show. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode. I'm Shane Hoda with Xgrowth, and today I'm talking to Belinda Pervan, Vice President for Asia Pacific in Japan for Marketing and Veeam, about how the Veeam marketing team keeps the creative juices flowing and ensure they're constantly testing new ideas and pushing boundaries. On that note, let's dive in. Belinda, thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you for having me. Hey, everybody. Absolute pleasure. Absolute pleasure. So let's let's dive in. Let's dive into the meat and potatoes of the conversation right from the bat. I, I, I'd love to kind of explore how Veeam encourages that, that creative element um, within the marketing team. What are some of the strategies? How does that how does that materialize? Yeah, sure. Um You know, I've never met a marketer that isn't flat chat busy at any company I've worked with. So for me, it's really about providing kind of more structured forums for the team um, so that they can sort of step out of their day to day um, and give them that time and that headspace to be creative. So a few things we do. We always, as part of quarterly planning, have some sort of component of creativity. I'm a big believer in getting cross-functional teams together, so channel team with the field team, um, the Australians with the Southeast Asia or Japan, and get that cross-pollination of ideas. We always come up with great ideas there every single time. Um, One of my lessons, though, is to kind of put some parameters around that creativity. I I remember doing a session maybe two years ago with the team, and they came back with, you know, we're going to have The Rock, and he's going to do voiceovers and all this sort of crazy creative sort of ideas and the rea- then they were really got disappointed when they couldn't execute on it so i guess that's my my lesson from doing those sessions put some parameters around the creativity put some goals and some clear guidelines and then like my team and and i'm sure like a lot of the marketers listening they're just innately creative they just want to have that ability and that time to let that creativity flow so yeah, we've done things like Shark Tanks, having a bit of fun around there. We do a global quarterly showcase of best practices and ideas between the three geographies. So between Americas and EMEA and APJ. And I, I quite like that because we're also really competitive, right? So I know like I always want to have like our team have the best ideas. So that kind of creates a little bit of a, oh, they've done this. What can we do next time? Which is quite cool. Um, yeah. And then I think finally, as a leader, just celebrating creativity. I think you know, we're all, and again, every company I work for, we're all very good at executing a program and then moving on to the next thing and executing a program and new things. So really just taking that time when our teams have done really creative things to acknowledge it, celebrate it, share. And, and, you know, I think that seeing other people stepping out of the date, stepping out of the norm and trialing different things encourages other people in the team to do the same thing. Got it. Got it. Really curious. You know, you talked about the qu- quarterly cross pollination, and then you kind of gave some examples: Shark Tank, and Global Quarterly Showcase. Is that is that what you meant, or is there another format for the qu- quarterly cross pollination, especially in the in the APJ space? How does that look like? Yeah, we do. So it depends. I guess COVID and post COVID too. We always do a quarterly planning get together in some way, shape or form. And so that may be a face-to-face just with the leaders. It could be all the APJ virtually, but we do some form of ideation and planning and strategy at least every six months as an APJ team and then as a smaller groups every every quarter. And so whether that's just the 
geography, so just ANZ China, and may set them sort of individual tasks or maybe all of the leaders coming together. As I said, every six months, we definitely get the whole APJ together in some way, shape or form. Got it. Got it. You also talked about you put parameters around like what is happening. Tell, tell me about that. What, what does that mean? Well, yeah, what it looks like is, um, you know, rather than just saying come up with great crazy ideas for the quarter or I think that example, I can't remember exactly what it was, but, you know, I could be saying, hey, we need to do a ransomware campaign, go and come back with ideas. What we might say is using that same example, all right, guys, we've got to do it. We've got a big ransomware push this quarter. The campaign that I want you guys to brainstorm around should be focused on enterprise pipe acceleration or volume play a volume play program to drive commercial or SMB business. So kind of some of those like audience parameters and then budget, you know, sometimes the ideas can be, you know, it's going to cost us half a million dollars. It's just not going to happen. Right. And then we pair it back. We pair the ideas back so much that they kind of feel disheartened that the ideas, because we only had 20 grand or something. So I try and put budget, never say it's 20 grand, but I'd say it's got to be somewhere under 100 or it's got to be between 10 and 50 or whatever that looks like just to give some sort of guidance. Um, So yeah, just a little bit of, not too rigid, but a little bit of guidance so that we can actually execute on it. And I also just say to the team, like you, um, you just have to be able to execute on this. Like if you can't visualize yourselves putting this in the plan and executing on it, don't put it in the ideation because otherwise, as I said, everyone kind of gets pumped and then disheartened. It sounds like that that has happened. Um, it has happened, before. yeah. Yeah, we've, we're past <laughs> that now, but we live by we live by our experiences, right? I love it. I, I mean, I feel like that's such a such a important reminder that say you, you would go and say, make sure you can execute. Like, great, like we got some awesome ideas. Yeah. Can we execute this? Because sometimes I feel like some people innately are are can see the negative and the challenges and the obstacles. And some people just can't and they see the positive and the excitement and, uh, and uh, they don't see all this stuff. So like, yeah, of course we can do that. And yeah. when it comes to uh, executing. But then also boy. having the balance of people in those groups, right? Because it's, it's important to have people that don't, that want to push the barriers that kind of go, oh, that's been difficult. We've tried it before, but let's give it another crack. Like it's important also to not just be narrowed down by the negatives because sometimes there's mm. ways, or ways around it as well. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Let's talk about, I know one of the things that is on the, on the menu at, uh, at Beam is experimentation. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Yeah, we're, um, we're really data driven at Veeam and very much results driven. And so I have a pretty strong mantra with my team. It's like, you just like making your pipeline target is not negotiable, not, not an option. So you have to write a plan that meets your targets. And and my team are really good at forecasting their, their outcomes of their plans now. Um, but once you've done that, the rest is playtime. So if you can write a plan with 90% of your budget or 95% of your budget, skim 5% off and put that aside for experimentation. So I think that's, I guess, the way I've probably shifted in, in my leadership. You know, maybe even five years ago, I would have just said, go all in, go hard at an idea. And if we fail, we'll kind of work around it. We'll navigate it. Now I'm kind of a little bit more pragmatic as far as we've got a duty to the business business to to get our results. But um, how we get those results is up to us. So get enough of the bread and butter going that you can play because we face it like we enjoy playing. We enjoy um, trialing new things. And, and so I think if we can kind of separate those two areas, but also then have like a really safe place for, I almost said the word failure. I hate the word failure, but a safe place to have things that don't necessarily always work and, and know that we learn from the things that don't go right as well um, and have that sort of experimentation. I think you use the word experimentation. And so, and I, and I also think as long as that experimentation is data-driven, right? Like we should be, we should be writing business essentially like a short business plan around like documenting these are our objectives, these are the outcomes that we expect, this is the process we're going through and making sure our stakeholders are briefed. And if we've kind of covered all those bases and we had a pretty good hypothesis about what we're going to do and why and then it doesn't work as we plan, that's all right. But if we kind of just go at things without putting the thought process behind it and then they don't work, then that's when we're going to get ourselves in trouble. But so I kind of think is that have the data, create a safe space and make sure you're still going to get your number. And then if it doesn't work, it's not 
it's not impacting the business really, but there's on the upside, there's like it's all upside. Everything you do there that works is positive rather than focusing on like it's the negative, like the negative, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to come and talk about the the data driven component mm-hmm. in in just a bit, but um, of like you know, how, hey, this is the creative work, and so I want to I want to come back to that. But mm-hmm. first of all, you talk about hey, you have your budget, five percent, ten percent put aside for experimentation. Okay. What does that What does that look like? Are we talking about like region, like Australia is like hey, I'm going to take five percent, ten percent aside. Is that across like APJ? Is that like even further narrowed down? Is it like field? How how does that how does that kind of divide look like? Yeah, I don't I don't set a budget per se. I it is done at a geography level. So the Australian New Zealand team, right. China, I've got six geographies. So that's definitely where it sits. My like I challenge I say to each of my field leaders, you know, you need to make sure at the end of the, each quarter you have something that you're going to be really excited and proud of. Like you've got a hundred things in your plan. Like what's the one thing at the end of the year? that the business is going to remember from Q1 and what's something at the end of the year they're going to remember, like what next year they're going to remember. And so having that one like compelling program, that is where you lift your creativity into. So I think like that, I think that's kind of where they're encouraged to have those conversations. But also to be completely honest with you, I've rejected, which sounds horrendous, but I've like sent a team back to redo their plan or to revise their plan because it just was, BAU it's like you've basically just done a save as of Q2 last year and it wasn't a bad quarter but like you're you're gonna you know you're, you're gonna be bored the audience is gonna be bored your sales team are gonna be bored and so what could we do to change things up and to their credit like they came back with a kick-ass plan like they it was just it was around a launch and it was a very BAU launch plan and they came back with these like insanely creative ideas and I think that sometimes is like just giving people the permission or the challenge to think outside the square and they really love it like they they thrive on it so I don't whereas I used to be a bit more timid as saying oh I think you could probably do this better I was like guys like it's just it's not really very compelling. Like, can you have another crack mm. and you've got another week to come back to me on it? And like people, people will actually thrive. They do. It's just that we're so busy and everyone, that's why I sort of stayed at the start of the call is like taking people out of their day to days is so important to me because I think otherwise we just get so busy and people run and then for, therefore when they're planning, they're also running and just kind of hitting a repeat on, on what they know works well rather than stepping back and going like, what could I do differently? Love it. Love it. Okay. I am pretty sure, just like me, a lot of people are like, okay, examples. What do we got? Can we talk about some examples where, again, maybe it was from the experimentation side or maybe it was just creative campaigns that uh, that you and the team have executed on? Yeah, sure. You know, I was talking about those workshops before where we got together every six months. We, I guess it was this time, middle of last year, we had one of those sessions. We had the all the leaders, so all my field leaders and all my functional leaders together. So my team's about 30 people, so there's like maybe eight eight people, 12 people together. And we had this idea, one of the teams had this idea, which was around getting a bus, ransomware again. Um, they had this big ransomware bus, and they were going to drive it around Australia. It was Australia they wanted to do, and they were going to do all these demos. And blah, 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 blah. Everyone got really excited, and the team did a really good job presenting it. And then... I like about maybe two weeks later, it was kind of, it was crickets. No one had heard anything, and I was like, "Okay, guys, where are we at with this idea?" Are we, and it had just sort of they realised it was going to cost way too much money, be far too hard work, and they just went. It kind of just dropped it, and I like, guys, we've been here before, and again, it was my leaders, so I was like, "We've done this before. We've had this conversation. Don't come up with ideas if you can't execute on it." And you, can, are you sure you can't execute on this? And one of my senior leaders went took the bull by the reins, by the horns and um, went and found a way to do it. And so we ended up evolving it to be hop on theme bus. You can Google it and have a look at it if anytime you like. But we did nine city trip around India. Again, India, cheaper to execute on. The theory being let's do it once in a country that works and get it working well. And then if we prove the, the business case, we can go look at it for other countries. We also then couldn't quite afford it. so. It evolved to being more of a channel enablement, like they, the all interior of it had like demo pod booths, demo pod booths, yeah, and they did a lot of channel enablement. India was on a big recruitment stage, so they were using it as kind of a PR and recruitment for the channel drive as well. And then it ended at the last city was where we had a big annual 
customer conference as well. So it was it was brilliant. Like the the bus just looked amazing. It was really cool. We ended up getting 12 times pipeline return on it, direct pipeline, direct input output. The thing that was really interesting for me, and you know, there's so much conversation now about demand generation versus brand investments, but we had a 300, just shy of 200, sorry, just shy of 200% increase in free traffic over the period the bus and the event was on from the year before. So it wasn't even wow. direct, it wasn't even direct pipeline and the channel people being the channel partners being uh, brought on to, into the business, et cetera, recruited. It was also like that brand piece that was really important to us. So I think it was just one of those really great examples of could have been a great idea that fell flat in its butt, but actually when we looked at alternative ways of executing different countries, different budget sources, different stakeholders, um, it was just a really brilliant, it was a, such a brilliant program. Yeah, really, really good. I love it. I love it. That sounds so. What it was, if anyone wants to look it up, it was the hop on hop on Veeam. I think if I just Google hop on Veeam, it should still come up. Yeah, hop on Veeam. I love it. Yeah, I love Very it. Cool. Okay, so you touched on a few things here. You've touched on the the twelve x pipeline. You touched on mm-hmm. the the two hundred percent increase in free traffic. I'm also really c- curious about how do you make sure that the creative ideas the team come up with are also data driven. So, um, can you can you take me through that? Of like, what what your approach has, your approach is with with regards to that? Yeah, I um I love the phrase the 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 name like cappuccino marketers, and it's like we were talking about this before. It's in I think in a long time ago, um, you know, marketing used to be a lot more based around the fluffy stuff and the fun stuff. And if it was creative and it made people feel good and it looked good, then it was kind of a, a success, deemed a successful program. And so now, like, I don't actually think it's an option whether to be data-driven or not. It's it's a necessity. And so I do think that a part of that is a responsibility of us on leaders to understand that some of the cappuccino marketers of the past need a little bit of help and enablement to be comfortable with data. I, I love digging into the data. So it's, it's a real comfortable place for me. I'm less comfortable coming up with creative ideas to be completely honest with you. I love this. So I have an amazing team to do it for me, but like we have to be understand that there's people that this is really an uncomfortable shift for them. And so part of it is enablement and, and really training and enablement and continual enablement on so that our team feel get comfortable really that they can articulate hmm. how, what their impact is. And I always think of it as business impact, right? Because not everything can come back to pipeline. There's stuff that we do in the channel, especially that isn't got a pipeline attached, but it has business impact. So I always anchor on like business impact. And so I think it's really just about making it part of the day-to-day dialogue and making it known that it's a not negotiable and that the team's always thinking about their business impact. And, you know, I even anytime we talk about people, they've got, I've got too much on my plate. It's like, okay, let's look at, take a step back and look at the, the 20 things you've got on. And if I had, if I told you to take out 10% of it, what would, could you take out without having any business impacts, like any negative business impact? And there's always stuff that you could take out without business impact you're doing because you've done it before or a salesperson really wants it, but you know, what salespeople are like. And uh, so, yeah, I think it's just that comfort level and just making it part of the day to day. I don't think there's ever a time that my team would put forward things now that doesn't have a expected ROI or an expected outcomes. That's just part of our just part of our culture and part of our our DNA now. Are there situations that somebody would come to you and say, Belinda, like I, this is an awesome idea. I'm just not completely sure. Like it would go in the brand bucket, right? So yeah. is is that measurable? Or I'm just not sure mm-hmm. how to make this measurable. Are those situations? Yeah. Do those situations come up? Absolutely, and and again, it comes down to business impact. But I can, like in Tableau now, I can look and see our pipeline, our leads, our through to pipeline, whether it's coming from free traffic, so anyone just typing Beam.com or anyone searching on Beam, through to whether it's come from global digital or whether it's come from my team. So I can look at year on year trends and say, and that example of in India, like I could say we're declining year on year of our free traffic. We need to invest in the brand and therefore putting money into something that was um, a, you know, the, the bus is that example is part of that justification was like we need to do something around the brand here. So this project program has dual purpose it has a recruitment it has an enablement it has a demand gen but it also has a brand component so there's still data that you can use to show that and and i was really vocal on the 
in the debrief process about that impact on the brand because yeah some of some things aren't some things aren't tangible we know that right but again that comes down to business impact business impact doesn't necessarily need to be a dollar sign business impact can mm. be you can measure things in other ways so i challenge people thinking i always look anchor in pipeline of course because it's sales care about bookings and pipeline that's all they really care about but ultimately there's other data points and there's other business impact components that we can look at got it well i want to ask you a couple of rapid fire questions but before going there okay. is there anything else that you think maybe i haven't asked or you think it's it's important for us to cover when it comes to kind of again fostering creativity and and building that muscle within the marketing team the other thing i would say i would add is that creativity comes from every person in the organization. And, you know, I mentioned before, I'm not the most creative, innately creative person. And, but then there could be someone that's the most junior person in my team that is like incredibly creative. So I think sometimes we just have to make sure that we are inclusive and think, think, you know, don't go to the same people for all our ideas, that diversity in perspective and that diversity in mindset. And that can be from it's International Women's Day today. So gender diversity, but also that diversity could come from gender, it could come from age, it could come from just your work background. But having that different perspectives, I think, is really important. So just something to keep in mind when we're looking at pulling smaller groups together or even when you have a group like work group with my APJ team, I always look at like who was together in the last group and try and mix those groups up. And you know, I spend a, probably too much time orchestrating some of those things to make sure that we kind of mix things up a little bit. Got it. Got it. Have you read the State of ABM and APAC report yet? If you have, you'll know that 59% of marketing leaders are intending to increase their ABM investment in the coming year. Even bigger news is 0% of survey respondents are going to decrease their investment. It's an exciting time for ABM in the region. Discover the state of account-based marketing in APAC today. Download the full report at abm.xgrowth.com.au forward slash report. That's abm.xgrowth.com.au forward slash report. Okay. All right. Let's do some rapid fire questions. Okay. First question. What is one resource? This could be a book, a blog, a podcast, whatever it is that has fundamentally had a fundamental impact on the way you work or you live. What comes to mind? Uh, it's a little bit it's a little bit cliched, but comes to mind is Brene Brown, the book around the power of vulnerability. And it, it, it probably comes to mind today because we've done some pre-writing around International Women's Day. But, you know, I grew up in a very, like grew up in IT tech, B2B always, and it's very male dominated. And I think, you know, your go-to behavior, you know, in the 90s or in the 2000s was, you know, to be that very much part of the boys club and to be that male ideology. And I, I think that evolution of leaders to me, that concept of vulnerability, you know, it used to be equated to being weak or the means you tell everybody in your team everything about your entire life. But it's um, this book, that book sort of showed me a little bit about it. I guess it kind of confirmed some of the modeling I'd seen in some other leaders that I really value, but just showing you that it can kind of be a like a bit of a superpower if, if it's harnessed correctly. And especially when you lead teams that are in that next generation and generations that just think about the world differently and think about want to engage at a different level. So that book was really powerful to me. I don't think that was a very rapid fire quick response. Sorry. That was, no, that was great though. <laughs> that was great. Um, that was awesome. Okay. Question number two, if you could give only one advice to B2B marketers, what would it be? One advice always aligned to the business. So anchor everything you do around the business priorities. And, you know, there's always going to be a hundred things you can do or should do in the eyes of salespeople and you could all work 24 by seven. It's just not worth it. It's absolutely not worth it on your health or your mental health or your family life. So just prioritizing, like understanding what the business priorities are and making sure that you're completely aligned to that. And then can I put a one A that's attached to that? One A would be um, communicate, 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 because there's no point, like communicate what you're doing, why you're doing them, the good, the bad, and how you're aligned to the business and how your results drive the business success. So they're they're linked, right? I can have two. Okay. I love it. I love it. Okay. Question three and last question. What's something that excites you about B2B today? I mentioned earlier, I'm a bit of a data nerd and I love it. So that actually really excites me. I love that we can show 
the business the value. But more importantly, I think at the moment I'm loving all the data insights tools. We were speaking about this last week. I lo- like all the stuff that's happening with Sixth Sense and tools like that, all the insight platforms or in- data intent platforms. I see kind of the shift towards that low touch selling. I, I talked to our CRO about this and he he we, we have a funny, funny conversation about how much marketing will impose on sales in the future, but it's a conversation for another day. But um, yeah, I think it's like where the sales and marketing partnership has never been closer and the insights and the, yeah, the information and intelligence that we can gather about customers and prospects that we can work hand in hand with sales to create opportunities for the business is, is exciting to me. Like it's, it's new and it's interesting. And, and I think that's the thing that's kept me in B2B marketing and tech for my whole career is that it's never stagnant and there's always new things to learn and to evolve our skill set. And, you know, for me, success for me is my team learning and, and my team evolving and, and them, you know, being a part of that growth is, is really exciting and really satisfying to me. I love it. Belinda, this has been an awesome conversation. And I'm sure just like me, a lot of the audience would take away a lot of stuff, especially around, again, that element of creativity and developing it in marketing teams. So I just want to say thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everybody. Today's episode of Growth Colony was produced by Alexander Hipwell and Liza Maywald. It was edited by Dave Semedo with additional editing by Liza Maywell and music arrangement by Alexander and Liza. Special thanks to Tina Wabe. We couldn't make the show without you. Growth Colony is hosted by Shaheen Hoda, Director of Growth at Extra. If you enjoy the podcast, please subscribe and give us a rating on Spotify or Apple Podcasts. Do you think you'd be a great guest or just keen for a chat? Send through an email at podcast at xgrowth.com.au. That's podcast at xgrowth.com.au. That's all for now. We'll catch you next week right here on Growth Colony.